to introduce, I'm going to go ahead and I'm proactive, our next state representative <laughs> in this area, uh, taking down Fletcher's place, Dr. Tom Alderson. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and a partner in the U.S. Anesthesia Partners, the largest anesthesiology group in Texas with over 1,100 providers. He's a tireless advocate for patients and their safety. Uh, Tom is recognized as an expert in office-based anesthesiology and consults with doctors and dentists throughout the state in order to make office surgery safer for patients. In recognition of his efforts to fight for conservative values, uh, Dr. Alderson and his wife were appointed to Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick's inaugural committee. Um, he is an unapologetic defender of life and small government conservative. Uh, Tom staunchly opposes abortion and advocates for free market and limited government regulations. He is also active in many Second Amendment organizations such as the National Rifle Association and the Texas State Rifle Association. As a successful small business owner, he understands that small businesses are the engines of our economy. Yay, I'm a small business <laughs> and this business experience taught him that American prosperity is best served through small business ownership and a spirit of volunteerism. He has, he models the spirit of volunteerism by working with and supporting many community and charitable organizations, such as Boy Scouts of America, he's an Eagle Scout, uh, Family Life Ministries, and many more. So all of that is his political background and what he has done for us in the community. But he's going to talk with us today as a grateful Christian. Uh, Dr. Alderson accepted Christ as his Lord in February of 1990, and since that time, he's walked many hills and valleys with his Lord. He's been a choir member, joined a Sunday school teacher, a lay youth leader, a youth Sunday school teacher, a small group Bible study leader, and more recently, an adult Sunday school teacher. He and his wife Jennifer, certified teacher, are active members of Jersey Village Baptist Church, the disciples, and they raise and homeschool their three children. And he is going to talk with us today, not about politics, but about his Christian walk and why. And we are going to be so grateful to have such a strong Christian representing us in, in Texas. And even though he's an anesthesiologist, he promised this speech will not produce him. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Lori. I appreciate the kind introduction, and I appreciate all of you for coming out today and giving me this opportunity to talk to you about something that's obviously very near and dear to my heart, and that's my faith as a Christian. Um, I remember when I when Lori approached me and asked me to do this, and she, I said, "Well." Well, what would I talk to a group of Christian business leaders about? And uh, she said, well, they want to know how your faith intersects the way you, you do your business and you know how, how to interact and, and what you've learned about that. And I, so I thought about that. I said, yeah, okay, so what, what does my experience as a doctor teach me about my faith? Probably a lot of things. <laughs> Let's talk about that. But I wanted to start because... From, from my perspective as a, as a Christ follower, I think any time we come together as Christians and we talk about our lives uh, in Christ and, and how walking with God daily has impacted our lives, I think it's really important that we give at least a few minutes talking about our testimony. And I think that telling a bit of your testimony, not only is it our custom as Christians, but I think it's really important because... It's how we witness to one another. You know, sometimes we think about witnessing as just what we do before somebody's saved, but the reality is, as part of the reason we come together as a body of believers, is to wit is this? Try that. It, it can, are you guys hearing me? Okay. It sounds like it's like. Okay. So part of the reason we come together as, as believers is because to be able to share our struggles and to be able to share our victories in Christ and the, and the situations that we come across as we go through life, um, that's how we encourage one another. And one of the things that I've learned through my, my years uh, in the faith is that uh, you know, I used to think that I was terminally unique. In other words, I used to think that I was the only one who ever had any of the problems that I had. And what I've come to find out the longer that I've been a Christian and the longer that I've, 
I've been a Sunday school teacher is that I have no unique problems. Um, there are always people out there struggling with whatever it is you're struggling with, so it's important that we talk about it. There were really three things as I think about my walk that sort of defined who I am as a Christian. And just briefly so you know, and, and Lori already mentioned it, I, I became a believer as a senior in high school. That was sort of my spiritual awakening. I, I can honestly tell you that I had one of those God-shaped hole in your heart kind of moments where you sort of wake up one day and you realize that your life isn't kind of working out like you wanted it to and you're anxious and you feel unsettled and you feel incomplete and you just don't know why. And I remember calling, um, praise God, I called one of my, my, actually one of my best friends at the time and I asked John, I said, John, why is your life so normal and happy and you don't seem to, you know, you seem to roll with the punches, everything's good and I feel so unsettled in my life and can you explain to me what, what you have got going on there? And he said, yeah. He said, let me tell you about Jesus. And so he walked me through a plan of salvation, and it was a, a week later on a Sunday at the United Methodist Church in Kingwood that I was walking down the aisle, and uh, I professed that Christ was my Lord and Savior, and I made a, a wholehearted decision to, to follow Jesus. And so, uh, obviously, best day of my life, right? Or, you know, my wife's not here. She would say there were other best days of my life. But, but even she would acknowledge that that's the best day of every Christian's life, right? Everything was going along fine, um, but when I was in medical school, I had my second spiritual awakening, and, and it kind of came on not, not as instantaneously as that first initial experience. It was more of a subtle thing, but I sort of found myself, I, I describe it as, I was sort of in a rut, and I kind of felt like my life was unmanageable. Now, I'm sure it's not going to shock you that uh, somebody in the middle of medical school has an unmanageable life or a difficult life, uh, the demands on a student doctors are pretty high and um, you know you get exposed to a lot of things like life death disease you know you start asking deep questions like well what is the meaning of life and you see mortality for the first time up close and personal and you realize how short life really is and I just I was just struggling and I couldn't snap out of it I, I had planned my life I knew which way I wanted to go and I got to this point in my life where it was just like I just kept hitting this wall and I couldn't get over it and life wasn't going in the direction that I thought it should go. And I was really struggling. And then, you know, I was talking with some friends about it, and I was praying about it, and I realized that my problem was my relationship with God. I had fallen into um, what's actually a well-known heresy in our faith, and that is the idea of deism, the idea of the watchmaker God. I had believed that uh, I had basically limited God. I had sold God short in terms of what he was capable of doing in my life and willing to do in my life. It had not really occurred to me up until that point that I could enlist God on a daily basis to help me with my personal struggles. I really honestly had this worldview where I felt like God had created me, God had given me abilities, uh, and it was up to me, you know, almost like how many of you had that electric football table when you were kids? Yeah, I see some people. Okay, so you know, you put the players on the field and you plug it in and then you just kind of sit back and watch, right? And I remember, you know, that was kind of my word picture of my relationship with God was that he kind of set everybody on the table and plugged it in and he was just sort of standing there watching us do our thing, you know, and I felt like it was all up to me. And when I realized, I started reading in Scripture and I came across a verse which I'm sure all of you probably know, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And then to that, I also ran across Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And I thought, you know, it may just very well be that God's as active in my life as I'm willing to allow him to be. And I had this second spiritual awakening. I remember getting on my knees and I said, God, I'm really struggling right now. And uh, I don't know how to save myself. I don't know how to get you know, over the wall, so to speak. Uh, but I believe that you can. I believe you have all power. And so I'm going to make a decision right here and now to turn my life and my will over to your care and your keeping. I'm going to stop worrying about where I go from here. And I'm just going to start doing the next right thing. And I'm going to leave the outcome up to you. And I can tell you unequivocally, I will never forget this as long as I live, I literally felt like 100 pounds came off my shoulder 
as shoulders as soon as I got done praying that prayer. I really, truly felt lighter, lighter spiritually. And it was an amazing experience. Um, and from that moment on in my life, I have really been in what I would consider to be a God-centered universe. I really look at my role in my own life as being uh, secondary to God's leading and God's direction. The, the word picture now, instead of the electric football table that I use to describe my relationship with God, is two people in the rowboat. And the thing that I love about that particular word picture as I describe my faith and my understanding of how God and I interact in my life is that the person, if you've ever rowed in a boat, you know that the person that's doing the rowing, that's moving the boat through the water, cannot see the destination. They have their back turned to the destination. They don't know where they're going. Only the person in the back of the boat with the rudder can actually see the destination. And so that's me and God in my life. That's how I look at it today. I'm the one doing the rowing. I put one foot in front of the other. I'm responsible for doing the next right thing. But the destination is up to him. Tremendous difference in my life. The results of that, when I made that decision, had that awakening, and was able to move away from my, my old understanding to my new understanding, God just started opening doors in my life. You know, very quickly I settled on a career path. I went from wanting to be a surgeon and being the center of the universe where everybody worshiped me to wanting to be an anesthesiologist, you know, where I was sort of the silent, unsung guy in the room that nobody really paid attention to unless things went horribly wrong and you just kind of quietly did your job. And I tell you, one of the things to this day, because I do try to practice humility in all things that I do, one of the things that I love about being an anesthesiologist is that it's very rare for me to see my name on the list of physicians being you know, singled out for exceptional service. And I always attribute that to the fact that being an anesthesiologist, you know, people don't really remember you. It's just like the pilot in the airplane. If you're doing a good job, people don't really remember who you are, unless of course the plane crashes in the Hudson, and then of course everybody remembers who you are and they make a movie out of it. But for the most part, people don't remember us when we're doing a good job. We're just sort of quietly there. You know, we have that patient's lives in our hands. They meet us, they talk with us, we help them through their fears and concerns, and, um, and then we just kind of do our thing. And, and I love that, you know. I, I really think that humility to me is one of the most important virtues that a Christian can have. I think if there is any virtue that sort of trumps all other virtues as a Christian, I think it has to be humility. You've got to live in that God-centered universe. You've got to realize that it's His universe. You're just a piece of it. And, and He's the one that's, that's, you know, you're following His lead. He's the one providing direction. The most recent revelation in my life, I would say, in, in sort of the last thing I'll tell you before we get into the specifics of how it, being a doctor makes me think differently about my faith is uh, for the last many years as a Sunday school teacher, I've, I've really been focused on the process of sanctification. And for those of you, I'm going to let the Sunday school teacher come out for a minute here. Uh, as you know, we move in, in, in our relationship with God from this process of justification where He calls us to be His children. He calls us to be His people. We accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, and then we go through this process here on earth where we're conforming to His likeness. And we call that process sanctification. And then ultimately, in the next life, when we receive our glorified bodies and we, we go to be with Jesus and, uh, and, and we go to be with God, we, we experience glorification. Um, but it's that process here on earth that fascinates me, that really sort of consumes a lot of my prayer life and just sort of the way I look at the world right now. Um, I remember I was a Sunday school teacher teaching adult Sunday school in 2005 here at, at First Baptist in Tomball. And we were doing a study on James, and it really kind of hit me for the first time because in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and lacking nothing. And of course, for those of you that have studied that verse, you know the immediate conversation that always erupts when you're looking at that for the first time is people say, well, this is works-based theology. This is, this is a doctrine of justification through works where I'm earning my salvation. But that's not it at all. That's not what James is saying. James is talking about sanctification. James is talking about a process by which God 
uses the valleys, the difficult things in our lives, like the consummate carpenter or the sculptor, takes the sandpaper, takes the chisel, and just sort of smooths off that rough edge because ultimately, as we move from being baby Christians to being mature Christians, that whole process, though it's not always pleasant, is a process of maturation. And that's what James is talking about. He's talking about God filing the rough edges off, whether it be in our relationships at work, in our marriages, in our dealings with our children, or our neighbors, our community, or even our own personal health struggles. He's conforming us, he's molding us to um, his son's likeness. And so I'll come back to that in a second, because as I talk to you about how that affects me as a doctor, sanctification is, is, a, is an important part of how I look at, at health care. That's a little bit about me, so how does it affect my work? Um, well, I think as an anesthesiologist, obviously I'm a doctor, I'm a healer, right? And anyone who spent any time reading the Gospels realizes that, that the greatest healer ever in the history of the world was Jesus Christ. He was able to do things that I can only marvel at. And so the first thing that I observe as a physician and as a Christian is that I, I get a sense of, of sort of uh, how far short I fall of the mark in terms of being like Jesus, in terms of being a healer. And I'm just awestruck by what it means to be. I get a real sense for what it means to be omnipotent. When we talk about God as all-knowing and all-powerful. Well, I can tell you there's a lot of things I can do in the operating room when you're under my care to, to protect you, to make sure that you have a good outcome. But there's just a whole lot of more stuff that God can do that I can't do. Um, I, I do my very best, but you know, as we all do, I think, in healthcare, but we realize that we can't cure all disease. We can't save everybody who's on death's door. And sometimes, despite our best efforts, people pass from this life to the next life. Um, and that, that is one of the hardest things, I think, as a physician, especially a physician in the operating room whose sole mission it is, like the pilot of the plane, to not let it experience a crash, you know. Um, that is my only real job, is to keep you alive. Um, now I can tell you that on, I can still count on one hand the number of people I've lost in 15 years of practice, so I don't want to give you the false impression that this is something that happens every day, okay, because it doesn't. But, but our God is an awesome God. You know, what I have to do with drugs and chemicals that have nasty side effects, you know, I think of things like chemotherapy, for example, or radiation to cure disease, God can do with a touch, with a word. Sometimes he mixes a little spit in, with some dirt and rubs some dirt on it, you know. I, that never worked for me. I know you've probably heard your high school football coach tell you to rub some dirt on it. That never made me feel better. But Jesus can cure blindness with that. He can cure chronic disease like leprosy. Um, he can even raise people from the dead. And, uh, and so when I say God is our great physician, and I do pray that often when I'm praying for patients. I pray for guidance from the great physician. I really mean that, because what he's able to do is so much greater than what I can do. I've seen miracles happen in the operating room. I can tell you there was one time, I, I clearly remember this, I was taking care of a patient and things were just not going very well. Uh, and we were kind of what I refer to as circling the drain. You know, we haven't crashed the plane yet. But, but the lights are all coming on and blinking and it's, you know, it's not looking good. And I remember looking at the monitor and just being washed over with this feeling of dread because I thought to myself, I said, this patient's going to die. And there's nothing I can do at this point. I've tried, everything I'm trying is not working. And so what I, I just did what I know how to do. You know, when I'm in a situation and I don't know what the next right thing to do is and I can't figure it out, I just pray. And I asked God to intervene, and I did, and I prayed, and I asked God to intervene. I said, God, I can't save this man, but I know you can. And so if it's your will, I would just humbly beg you, help me to do the next right thing. Help me to intervene here. Help me to save this person so that he can go home to his family. And God intervened. And, and I don't know what I, I still don't know what I did, you know. Um, I, didn't, I actually don't think I did anything. I think it was all God's doing. But, but the man improved. His vital signs improved. He got better and he went home that day. And that was a blessing. And I can tell you likewise, I've seen situations where people have been uh, doing very poorly. And they go into the operating room and we say to ourselves, this is heroic surgery. We're doing this as a last resort. But honestly, 
whether this person lives or dies has very little to do with what we do here today. Or we go in expecting to find cancer that's uncurable. But because of the power of prayer and people have prayed over this loved one, we get in there and it's a miracle. I've been in the operating room and I've, I've seen them open the belly expecting to find all kinds of cancer and there's no hope and we get in there and the cancer is gone. I've seen it. And so I know that prayer works and I know that miracles still happen and that's one of the beautiful things that we do see in healthcare. The last thing that I thought of as I was thinking about how healthcare and my faith intersect, and this is a little harder to articulate, but I think it's important because it gives us hope. It gives me hope in the difficult times when we, when we lose loved ones. And, and that is that just this idea, we come back to this idea of sanctification. I told you I'd come back to that. As a very young doctor working in the ICU in St. Louis, it, it always amazed me, often frustrated me, and, and really left me in a position of sort of questioning God's plan sometimes. To see people would come into the ICU and they'd have a rap sheet a mile long. They just shot a police officer. They'd been shot themselves. Um, and they would go through surgery after surgery, endure complication after complication. I remember one young man, he was in the ICU for two months had his colon removed, his part of his intestines, his liver, his spleen, you know, part of the, obviously not all of his liver, but part of his liver, multiple operations, multiple infections, ended up getting a tracheostomy to breathe, a feeding tube to feed, severely deconditioned, and yet he pulled through. And two months later, he's being wheeled out of the ICU, and we're all so proud, all of us young doctors, we'd all taken care of him at some point. We said, goodbye, Mr. Jones. Congratulations to you, sir. We hope that you, you, know, you, you heal well. And he didn't say a word, but he did manage to take the time as he was being pushed out of the ICU to raise his hand ever so slowly and, uh, and give us the one-fingered salute. And I thought, what a cretin. And why is it that this guy gets to live, and yet somebody who comes to the ICU who's a mother of three, grandmother of nine, beloved by her family, surrounded by her women's group and members of her church praying over her, a freak accident, a sudden stroke, a ruptured artery in the brain, and no matter what I do, everything just doesn't work. And it's so frustrating and we end up losing her. And I say, God, that is just so not fair. Here's this person who is literally a, a plague on our society, and yet he's unkillable. Nothing we do does, harms him. It's like he's bulletproof and invincible. And yet this sweet person who's got surrounded by family who love her, need her, want her to be restored to full health, you decide to take her instead. Well, I come back to James. Perseverance has finished its work so that you are mature and lacking nothing. And, and I can't prove this to you. This is sort of the Sunday school teacher branching out and in uh, proselytizing and, and coming up with his own ideas, but I choose to believe that in those moments, the reason why that guy lives and the reason why she doesn't live is because God calls her home. And the reason he calls her home is because she's run a race, she's stayed true, and perseverance has finished its work. Her process of sanctification is completed and his is not. And so God has need of her. He's prepared a place for her as he's preparing a place for all of us. Her place is ready, her soul is prepared, and it's time to go home. And so I don't know if that is meaningful to you, if you've been in a situation like that, but if you find yourself in that situation, I would just ask you to consider whether or not the reason that you lost your loved one is because God was ready for her or for him to come home. And I know my personal experience is that I can't do anything to counteract God's will as a physician. Uh, his will is infinitely more powerful than mine. Well, that's how it affects me as a doctor. And, and I've, had, I've had conversations with several of you before, and I know you all want to know about my life as a politician or as a future legislative leader. And as, as Lori mentioned, I'm, I'm just beginning in this process, you know. Um, let me tell you briefly how I got involved in politics, because uh, I think it's important. This was not something that I really ever saw myself doing. This was not part of my plan, okay? As I mentioned earlier, I had my plans. That was not part of my plan. Uh, but over
Many years I've had people tell me repeatedly, we need you to go into public service. You have the right heart, you have the right ethics, the right morals, the right values, and we need you. I remember there was one lady, her name was Liz. Her husband had served in the U.S. Congress for about 15 years. And God brought us together through a mutual friend, and she was sitting on the back porch of my house. We were watching her grandkids and my kids swim in the pool on the 4th of July in 2012. And she says to me, we need you to serve. This country needs you. And I said, why? And she said, because you have the right morals, the right ethics, the right values. I said, yeah, I, I've heard that before. But my problem is when I look around, when I look at Austin, when I look at, at Washington, D.C., I don't really see that. And she gets right in my face and she says, it's because people like you who have the ability to do this job and do it well refuse to stand up and sacrifice themselves is exactly why we have the people we have in Washington. Because if you won't do it, there are people who are willing to do it, but they don't share your values. So at the end of the day, it, you have only yourself to blame. Now I'm a little slow, so I had to pray on that for a good th two, almost three years. But finally I did come to the conclusion that she was right and that that actually was what God was calling me to do. And it was funny because my wife, independent in her own prayer life and her own process, came to me almost the same time I came to that conclusion. And she came to me and she said, I really feel like God's calling our family into public service. I don't, can't explain to you why. I just People keep telling me. I just feel I said, you know what? That's it. It must be true because that's exactly what I keep getting to. So uh, we prayed together about it and we decided if that was God's will, I would be willing to serve in that way, but he would have to call me. He would have to open a door and I can tell you that it was a very short time afterwards when my state representative announced that he wouldn't be seeking re-election. And I said, well, God, I guess we're really doing this then. Um, and, uh, and that was kind of a nerve-wracking experience. So Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, <clears throat> a very important verse for me. As I think about my role as your state representative, as a Christian, and because I make no bones about it, I'm, I'm going up there to serve him by serving you. And that's my primary function. And so there are certain things that I'm not willing to do just because they're expedient or because they sound like a good idea. And so Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 is really meaningful to me in this respect. And I can promise you, if you come visit me in Austin, you'll see it on my desk where I can see it no matter who I'm talking to and what conversation I'm engaged in. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than upon Christ. Now, the Sunday school teacher is going to come out again for a second here. I hope you all don't mind. But there's two parts to that verse which are incredibly impactful to me and very meaningful as a public servant. One is when it talks about those spiritual forces. We have to understand who those forces are. Folks, whether you realize it or not, we live in a world where the struggle is a struggle between good and evil. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There's that word choice again, spiritual forces. Folks, I know that the devil is real. And I know that his plans for our country and for our state are very different than God's plans. And I have volunteered to go directly to the front line to fight in that battle. Martin Luther once said that where the battle is waged, there is the loyalty of the soldier is tested. And I have volunteered to go right into the thick of it. But I know that dark forces don't want me to succeed. They do not, the devil does not want for our country to be a God-fearing nation anymore. In fact, the devil doesn't want us to pray, not in our schools, not in our school board meetings, not anywhere. And even still, even though today we still have that First Amendment protecting us, you see people, particularly progressives, chipping away at that, saying, well, it's not really freedom of religion, is it? It's freedom to worship. And after all, you worship in your church or your synagogue, so don't bring that stuff out to the public square. Don't bring that to work with you. We don't want to hear it. Forces of darkness. The other most important word, and probably the most important word 
in that scripture verse is the word captive. Folks, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I know this is being recorded, so someday this may come back, but I don't think it'll come back in a way that bites me. I'm just going to tell you that I personally don't believe that our president is a born-again believer. But I don't think he's evil either. I think he's a captive. I think he's been taken captive by deceptive philosophy that stems from the dark forces, spiritual forces of the universe. He's part of that battle too, but he's on the other side and he doesn't know it. Because he's a captive, he thinks what he's doing is right. He thinks it's right to destroy the concept of traditional marriage. He thinks it's right to force schools to adopt transgender policies that create tremendous confusion in our young people as to what is the meaning of biologic sex. You know, the Bible is pretty clear about that, right? Jesus even says in the beginning he made them male and female. I mean, it doesn't get any more simpler than that. But I think that because of that word captive and because of that particular thing, I think it's really, really important how we as Christians respond. Obviously, we have to fight back. We have to hold the line. We can't be also taken captive. And we can't allow our state to be taken captive, and we can't allow our nation to be taken captive. So we must resist, but we must resist not with condemnation, but with Christ's love for the simple fact that these folks are not our enemies. Our enemy, as it says in Ephesians, is not an enemy that we can necessarily see. It's a spiritual enemy. Those people that he uses to carry out his will, they're captives. And we need to set them free. And so to me, that's probably the overarching theme as me as the politician and how I will act on your behalf. But the other part of that is that I'm worried. Because when I read Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 19 through 20, it tells me, and of course now this was directed to the nation of Israel, but I think it's equally applicable to the United States of America. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed like the nations before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. And folks, make no mistake about it, our country was founded with God's explicit blessing. At the Constitutional Convention, it was the least religious man among them, Benjamin Franklin. They were getting absolutely nothing done. And he stood up and he said, maybe if we began our deliberations each day with a word of prayer, we might actually get this Constitution written. And lo and behold, just like my life was, was totally awakened when I turned my will and my life over to the care of God, so too when our forefathers turned the future of our country over to the will of God, not only was God's will done, but they actually got that Constitution written. And they didn't even have a whole lot of fights about it. So make no mistake, our country is a nation founded with God's explicit blessing. And if it was true for the nation of Israel, you have to ask yourself, is it not also true for our nation? Our nation, which is less than 300 years old? How many more years do we have left if we continue down this pathway? Now, I don't want you to worry about that every night. Well, you can if you want to, and certainly pray about it. But know that that's my job, okay? That's why you elected me, because I need to worry about that every day. And you will find that scripture verse in my office in the Capitol also to remind me why I'm there. Where, am I, where is that battle being waged? It's being waged at the point at which I need to hold the line. I need to hold that ground which we have and preserve that legacy that we have, that we are a God-fearing nation, and in God we trust as it's written on our currency. And if I can, with his help and with your help, push the tide back and reclaim some of those religious freedoms that are being chipped away and clearly state that the state of Texas doesn't care what the Obama administration says. We believe that every person has the right to practice their religious faith in Texas without fear of persecution or prosecution, whether that be in their churches, their synagogues, their businesses, their schools, everywhere. And so, thank you. Yeah, you can definitely clap for that. And so that's my, my commitment to you. Now, finally, as I said, our struggle, my struggle in Austin is not against people. It's against powers and principalities. It's against dark forces. And make no mistake, I have no illusion about where the devil's stronghold in Texas is. 
It's that blueberry in the bowl of salsa that Governor Perry used to talk about called Travis County. And you're sending me there, and I prompt my pledge to you is I will put on the full armor of God. My ask of you is that I need your prayer. I need prayer warriors behind me because the devil doesn't need to destroy me in order to prevent me from achieving my objective. He needs to dis discourage me. He needs to distract me. He needs to get me bogged down in the things that really don't, aren't really kingdom work. And so I need you to pray that I would stay true to his leading, to God's leading, that I would have the courage. There was a, a man, actually, I, I don't know if you've read this story, in, in uh, I think it's in 2 Kings. No, it must have been in 1 Kings. It was talking about uh, David, one of David's mighty men. His name was Benaiah. And Benaiah is a picture of courage in the Old Testament because he went down, he chased a lion into a dark pit on a snowy day. He went down into that dark place where the darkness was and he slew that lion that was oppressing the village. I need that kind of courage. I need to be the kind of guy that will go. Sir. That's a great question, and I think that the, the answer is that I think most folks that practice in healthcare, it's very hard to be a healthcare provider and be an atheist uh, because you see things. And it's not just the miracles that you see, but it's also the wondrousness of God's creation. You know, we talk about in intelligent design, for those of you that have read on intelligent design, we talk about this concept of irreducible complexity. The idea that a structure, a, a, an organ, for example, and I think the, the one that's commonly thrown out is the eyeball. The eye cannot function without all of its pieces working properly together in unison. And so it's a poor metaphor for evolution because it's one of these things that could not have developed slowly over millions of years. It has to all be there all at one time. If even one piece is missing, it, it's non-functional. I'll tell you the other thing that I learn, um, and I think that a lot of us learn, is that uh, healthcare now is really, not only is it, um, is it a diversity of, of people providing it, but it's a diversity of religions and religious traditions. And uh, it's interesting to me that uh, I probably interact with more different faith traditions in the hospital than pretty much any other place I go in my life. And uh, I'm always surprised to realize that although I know who the true king is, and I know what I believe, and I know what truth is, uh, I'm always surprised at whether we're talking the Jewish faith or Islam or Buddhism, how there are so certain essential truths that we all share. You know, we all have this understanding of a power greater than ourselves, of a God. Um, we all, and, and interestingly enough, you know, um, I always find it interesting that the, that the Muslims, uh, and there are a lot of Muslim physicians actually that I practice with, but Muslims as a group are very pro-life. They're very pro-traditional marriage. They're very pro-religious freedom. And I remember reading something one time and it was talking about all the different heretical cults within Christianity and how there were all these splinters off of mainstream Christianity that were heretical for one reason or another. But the preface of that book, the author talked about how for the sake of our nation, for the sake of our politics, for the sake of preserving our religious freedom, it was truly important that we engage with all, even if we 
have different views about the nature of God and the, and the pathway to salvation and, and who God is and what heaven looks like. On these things that are social issues that we can agree upon from a spiritual perspective, we must unite together as peoples of faith and we must crusade together to preserve our religious freedoms and our nation's reliance and dependence and acknowledgement of, of God Almighty. Uh, so, so that's kind of, um, I guess, how I would answer that. So, it's, it, so the answer is yes, but it's, it's a little more complicated than that just because of the diversity that you see. Great question. Any more questions? Wow, no questions? I have put you to sleep, haven't I? I failed, I failed as an anesthesiologist. I did my job. Brenda. Well, and you know, I'm glad you brought that up because it kind of speaks to what I was saying. You know, th this, is a, this is a battle, folks. This is a battle between good and evil. Um, and uh, just because we're here in the United States and, you know, our lifestyle is pretty good and, you know, you know we don't have a whole lot of people being decapitated in the streets of, of, uh, of Houston, unlike, you know, in Syria and Iraq, uh, it does not mean that evil is not present here. And uh, one of the difficult things about being a servant of God, and Jesus talked about this, actually he was talking to his disciples, and he said that um, a servant is not greater than his master. If the world hated me, it will hate you also. And you know, to be a country that has for so long stood for freedom and religious tolerance and a reliance on God and acknowledgement of God, the devil hates that. He would like nothing better than to snuff that light out, you know, to see this nation descend into anarchy or socialism or just tear itself apart. Um, and unfortunately, as I mentioned, he has an army of people that he's taken captive through deceptive philosophy to do his bidding. Mm-hmm. And, and no doubt in my mind that that mayor believes that he's doing the right thing because he's been taken captive. You know, he honestly thinks he's doing the right thing by putting this firefighter in jail. And folks, I mean, that's, that's really where it is. You know, Martin Luther was right. Uh, we, have a, we have an opportunity to go to where the battle's being waged and have our loyalty tested. Or we have an opportunity to just stay at home and you know, make, make sharp words at the television and say, that ain't right. Go to church on Sunday and just leave it at that. Now, that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm here. I'm asking for your help, your support, your prayers. Uh, I'm willing to fight that battle. I'm willing to represent you in Austin in that respect. But I would encourage each and every one of you to take up your cross as well. Because it's going to take a lot of us. We've got to turn this tide back. We have sat by idly for so long as a Christian nation. You know... I had a chance to meet with Donald Trump and a group of another, about a hundred other, actually it was probably more like a thousand other Christian leaders in June. Some of you may have heard about this. I, I wrote about it on my, on my, my Facebook page. I, I wrote a little article, you can find it, but Donald Trump, for all of his difficulties, is very shrewd when it comes to the issue of religious freedom. 
He said, the single most important thing I can do to restore the balance and give the power back to the people and churches and restore our faith in God is to repeal the Johnson Amendment. Y'all familiar with the Johnson Amendment? Senator Lyndon Johnson passed an amendment, I think it was in 1951. Uh, basically what it did was it, um, it threatened the tax-exempt status for any 501c that would speak about political matters, that would, that would use political advocacy as part of its message. And so uh, if you're an organization like Planned Parenthood, you say, that's fine. I'll just form a different not-for-profit that's, quote, political action committee, and I'll talk about my politics all day long, and then I'll have my not-for-profit over here. So who does the Johnson Amendment really hurt? It hurts our churches and our synagogues. It hurts our places of worship because our pastors are priests. They're not free to talk about the intersection between faith and politics, what we're doing here today. They're not free to do that. If they do it too much, the IRS comes and says, I'm afraid we're going to have to take that tax-exempt status away. And Donald Trump said, you know, it occurs to me that the average citizen walking down Fifth Avenue has more right to free speech than a pastor does. And that's wrong. And he said, if I'm elected president, that's the first thing I will do. And so, um, anyway, that's, that's something we need to do, for sure. Questions? Four? I just wanted to thank you so much. Thank you.